So it's really wonderful to be here. And I had nostalgic feelings about a group uh, when Dr. Rowley led us as I actually landed uh, last night in St. Louis because I was a postdoctoral fellow and I got a McDonnell Foundation Award to come to Phil Majerus's lab. Uh, and we had a welcoming dinner in his home on Sunday evening. So as I landed, I was like, this is deja vu, McDonnell Foundation. Uh, uh, but really it, uh, wonderful to be here. And then as we were talking about region and night P, I had nightmares because I spent my whole early career mapping chromosome 9 and 9P, and I'm thinking, why am I talking about breast cancer? I should go back to 9P. But you have to evolve your career somehow, so it's really wonderful to come back to really where it all started. Because it started because Dr. Rowley uh, really, uh, you know, was a really wonderful cytogeneticist. And I remember, I, in 1987, going to ask her what I should do because I went to the University of Chicago for my training because she had published about risk-adapted treatment of leukemia. And as a, somebody aspiring to go into oncology, you saw all those successes when you did risk-adapted treatment. And so I went and she gave me uh, really the best idea that any mentor could give was, well, you know, I did cytogenetics, but I don't think the future is in cytogenetics. <laughs> I think you should go and learn molecular biology and know how DNA works. And that's how I ended up thinking, okay, how does DNA work? And I worked with um, Manuel Diaz, and she, everybody had picked up all the chromosomal rearrangement, so I was left with deletions. And I remember the catalog of chromosomes in, in leukemia and thinking, okay, where is a chromosome that crosses to other solid tumors so I can distinguish myself from her? And she gave me chromosome nine in ALL, and the rest is history. So why did I start doing breast cancer? It was because Dennis Slayman and Everyone would know that Dennis Slayman um, was also a, you know, uh, a MD PhD scientist who came to the University of Chicago, and at that point he had gone to UCLA, and he thought, "I'm going to do her too new because this is gene on chromosome 17 may be important in breast cancer, because when." Um, we were all sort of coming in and thinking about translational research as medical oncologists, and we were sent to the lab to learn the science of oncology. You had to start somewhere, and what we started was what is known about this area, and where is the heterogeneity, where is the risk-adapted treatment that we are going to be working on. So at UCLA, you know, uh, um, Dennis Clemon was working on HER2. We know that UCLA contributed to the BCR ABLE and BCR ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The rest is history. We know if we can track those genetic abnormalities in the diseases, we will get to actually drug ABLE targets. So for those who are too young to remember mapping genomes, that's what you did in the 70s and 80s. Now, fast forward. So this paper was published about estrogen receptor negative, node positive breast cancer should be treated with chemotherapy because of 50% risk of recurrence in 18 months, right? All the solid tumors in those days did not have a way to, to actually culture the cells. So you had to figure out how to treat. So we developed treatment based on you know, let's just combine chemo A plus chemo B and chemo C and then we'll figure it all out, right? And we'll then see who gets what. And that's sort of how we started. We were borrowing from leukemia and lymphoma where we were doing risk-adapted treatment and people were getting cured. 
right? You wouldn't treat anybody with 1517 translocation without knowing that this is a 1517 translocation. So that's the idea that we then took to breast cancer. I was like, why are we doing bone marrow transplant for breast cancer when in fact you can see this heterogeneity? Who should get transplanted? And why should they get transplanted? What are the drugs? So that was really the motivating factor for me to think about, let's do risk-adapted treatment for solid tumor. And of course, I had to survive at the University of Chicago, because you're not going to get promoted in the same university doing the same work that your mentor is doing. So I quickly pivoted to breast cancer. And it was nice that Mary Claire King at the time was also thinking about the importance of the germline, right? And most of us who started off with somatic genetics never think about the germline. But there was real precedence in the genetics literature that if you go to somebody and ask them about their family history, they can tell you about their family history. How profound. So that's why as a professor of human genetics, and going to genetics meeting and mapping genes, I also happened to map, find people who were mapping genes. So 9P, there's a melanoma susceptibility locus on 9P, and that's why those of us who mapped 9P in those, gene, in those uh, days met both the people who were mapping to localize disease genes and people who were mapping to look at the minimum region of overlap of the deletions to then find our tumor suppressor gene. In the meantime, I went to a garden conference, and um, actually it was Cold Spring Harbor Conference, and I met Mary Claire King, I met Francis Collins, and they were all mapping disease genes. And I, it occurred to me that I'm a clinician, I see all these people who come with their families, so why don't I think about bringing the two together? And so that's where this 34-year-old black woman actually transformed my life because she came in with five generations pedigree, right? And Mary Claire King had told me to go and find pedigree so that we can map the, uh, uh, and localize BRCA1. I wasn't planning to be mapping, you know, a chromosome 17, but then we started collaborating and this woman took me to their family reunion and then we used the proband and we treated her. She was on a clinical trial. And then, of course, if you do use adramycin, which was sort of the drug that was our own donorubicin, right? So I was treating this woman with donorubicin. You know, we were looking at her secondary leukemia and all the treatment-related side effects in the same department. And I was beginning to connect the dots that these young women must, there must be something that is making them have adverse events that's affecting their bone marrow. And then, of course, we mapped the gene, we found BRCA1, we were able to track that this woman actually, this generation of her family, with everybody dying of breast cancer, had BRCA1 mutation. So then, what's the next thing we should do? We should translate the findings in the clinic. And I was very proud that uh, uh, Dr. Frank, God rest his soul, by the time BRCA1 was identified and the Utah group had split to start Myriad Genetics, I had lots of samples because I had banked every sample, like Dr. Rowley banked samples. We concerted them and we were able to show at that time that BRCA1 is indeed a genetic susceptibility to breast cancer BRCA1 segregated among all these families. But guess what? Because there were a lot of variants of unknown significance, the more you treat black people, the more you're going to find variants of unknown significance. The first 10 papers that were published was about Ashkenazi Jews and BRCA1. The first things that were in the media was about Angelina Jolie and BRCA1. And Mary Claire King and I kept saying, but look at these families, right? In fact, one of the, the first science um, paper that looked at uh, a BRCA1 segregation included an African-American family with a, with a missense mutation. And it was highly penetrant. And everyone said the penetrance is 87%. 
then have bilateral mastectomy because the penetrance is 87%. That was wrong because penetrance depends on how the families were ascertained, right? We never could get anybody to be studied unless they have more than four affected relatives, right? Because we wanted to find the gene, right? So you did an experiment to show the tip of the iceberg. Is that clear? So you couldn't in your wildest dream, say that the penetrance is 87%. Then I look at my African-American families. They were slaves, and the only way they could keep their family history was by making sure they wrote the names of everybody. And nobody included their pedigrees in all of these penetrance studies. And of course, slaves who didn't have any way to get access, how would they be able to show that they survive cancer, right? So everybody sees the gene and then they associate bad outcomes because you are black. That couldn't be farthest from the truth, right? So, you know, of course, President Obama, who happened to be my neighbor and his wife, they were working at the South Sound in Chicago, on the South side of Chicago, and we said, we need to do community engagement to see how we can actually do genetics research. Because everyone, and I can tell you, everyone in the genetics community thought BRCA1 was gonna be the same as Huntington's disease. And we fought and we argued and we said, this is gonna be the worst thing you can do. We were paternalistic. And I was like, this cannot happen. So the American Society of Clinical Oncology, they happened to have appointed me to be on the Cancer Genetics Education Task Force. And we said, look, in oncology, the worst news we give anybody is you have cancer, it is metastasized, and there is no cure. So if we can give those kinds of bad news to people, why can't we tell them that if you do an intervention, you may not die from breast and ovarian cancer. So I'm giving you the historical perspective because that's what the genetics community said to us in 1996. And even when I had published in the New England Journal of Medicine that clinical cancer genetics, the time is now, we had evidence, animal models, everything, that this is predictive, right? The genetics community absolutely would not support genetic testing. So when President Obama was then elected to, um, to the Senate, and I went to his staffer, and I said, we need to do precision medicine. Because, you know, blacks don't want to touch genetics because they're going to discriminate against them. We have the history of eugenics, and we have the fact that we've excluded the population. So why should they sign up to genetics? Because you're going to use it to discriminate against them. The uh, breast cancer advocates, they said, you know what, we want cures for breast cancer. So we are going to support this, but you need to do uh, uh, protection. So we passed HIPAA, we passed GINA. There was no law we didn't pass together with the advocates to protect patients so they can participate in research. And 30 years later, we're still talking about the fact that people don't have access. Right? So just think about that. Let's fast forward. We all got very excited about a new tool that we all have, DNA microarray. Who doesn't have DNA microarray in their labs to do molecular diagnosis, copy number changes, everything? The technology just keeps getting better and better. Okay? So this is a technology that, uh, that got better, and uh, Adam Falk was working with Jeff Trent and Jeff Trent and Dr. Rowley were actually good friends because Jeff was doing melanoma, he could do the culture, he was at the NCI, he, was, he left Michigan to go to the NCI. And I saw this paper in New England Journal, five BRCA1 mutation carriers, and they had ER negative breast cancer. And their gene expression profile was very different, markedly different from the uh, gene expression uh, of uh, BRCA2 and then sporadic cancers. This was not a, lo a lot of samples. And one of the things that was really profound was that they could classify all the BRCA1 mutation carriers very well, except there was one that was misclassified 
BRCA1 was not mutated in the germline, but somehow we had also discovered methylation. In fact, methylation was what drove me out of uh, NIP because when we got um, uh, CDKN2, P16, MTAP, and we saw that whole chromosome region on NIP, we saw that it could be methylated. And I was like, how could two megabases of chromosomes be deleted and have homozygous deletion, but then you can just methylate the second copy and it's the same result. And it wasn't until we had a good under understanding that methylation can also silence genes and that methylation is an environmental or epigenetic way to actually silence genes. Then I had my aha moment because it was clear, we in fact wrote a letter to the editor, it was my, it was um, uh, Tatiana Grushko. At that time, we were doing fluorescence in situ hybridization because that's what I knew what to do. So we showed that P16 can be homozygously deleted in, in brain tumor. We saw that uh, in lung cancer, in everything, you do fish, which is what we do. And then we showed on, uh, on chromosome 17 that you have P, you have uh, BRCA1, you have HER2, and you have uh, uh, P53. And all of those genes are profoundly important in solid tumors, but people were not paying attention to them. But I saw them on chromosome 17, and we started mapping them and looking at how they might be really contributing to aggressive forms of breast cancer. That's where the aggressive forms of breast cancer came in, because P53 is the number one gene that really is a, just is the guardian of the genome. They have chromosomal instability, they have chromothipsis, they have everything that you dream of as a cytogeneticist, and you didn't have a way to look at it. And then we saw P5, uh, we saw HER2, HER2 gets amplified, double minute, lots of copy numbers. And you will see that those tumors are very different from the BRCA1 mutated tumors, because they don't go through that pathway. So immediately, we had, by looking under the microscope and doing fish, we saw that BRCA1 tumors are very different, and they don't tend to amplify HER2. So that it was telling us something about the chromosomal structure and why this chromosome region, and I was so delighted that you guys are annotating based on the gene and the region because it's more complicated than that. So then, having answered that question, then we realized, okay, is it gene, is it the environment? And this is where we now are talking about how do you integrate all of these latest advances to the social determinants of health? Because whenever anyone talks to me about genetics, they'll say, yeah, but you know, how about the social determinants of health? And I have to say, I am just a geneticist. I didn't create the system. I work in the system, and I'm just about discovering why. So Dr. Rowley taught me to ask why. Every time we looked at a patient and we asked, why did this person respond this way and this person didn't respond this way, we went to look under the microscope. So I go back and I said, okay, we need to get to the root of breast cancer heterogeneity by studying black women across the African diaspora. And this paper, was published during the pandemic. If you don't have it, I think you should go and have it because it's about a discussion on is 23andMe a legitimate company that is just taking everybody's DNA and should we have direct-to-consumer marketing? Some of you might be involved in direct-to-consumer marketing, but we know that as people were being paternalistic, patients were going to look for information Right? I remember the first person who wrote a check for $2,500 to get the Myriad test was a rich man who was just curious, why did I get breast cancer? And we found a BRCA1 mutation. So it was clear to me that if we're using family history and we're using the highly penetrant families to get the test to people, we're, not going to, we're just not touching the tip of the iceberg. So this paper came out and talks about genetic admixture. I'm not going to break the paper down because you all know about genetic admixture. You know how uh, uh, more than 10 million Africans came, depending on who the colonizer was, 
they landed on different places. And there's been war, and there's been so many things that get people to be displaced. And I, I, I know when we talk about genome-wide association studies, Mary Claire King would say, oh, well, that's just due to, you know, a population uh, structure, because, you know, people stay in their own region, and then they intermarry, and it has nothing to do with genetics. But, you know, those are truths that we have, right? But this population structure, as you go from uh, uh, North uh, 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 America to South America, you will see different levels of admixture. In Bahia, which is right here, uh, southern, uh, northern Brazil, the first time I got to northern Brazil, I thought these were my long-lost relatives because they're Yorubas. They, they study Yoruba gods. They eat the same food, Akaraje, as I. They may have changed it from Akara to Akaraje, but the Catholics converted their Yoruba gods to deities in Catholicism, and they continue Santeria as their own religion because they were slaves. They sang songs, and they kept their culture. So that's why we cannot do genetics without thinking about cultural practices and what people are talking about. So when I got to Brazil, these people are Yorubas, even though they live in Brazil. If you go to the tip, the southernmost tip of, uh, of uh, Brazil, and I went there because, of course, between Argentina and Brazil, there's always the World Cup rivalry, because who has the gene for the best footballer in the world? Pele is my guy, <laughs> right? Pele is Nigerian. Every time they kick us out of the World Cup, we immediately become Brazilians, <laughs> right? Well, on the other hand, on the southern port part of uh, Brazil, they are Europeans. They want to claim Italian heritage or G German heritage. It doesn't matter. All of us come from somewhere, right? And you couldn't find people as, that are mortal enemies as Brazil and Argentina when it comes to football. So people will say football explains the world. It explains the world in the sense that it brings us all together. We have passion about things that we care about. But as scientists, we have to be honest that we need to do a lot more to understand the genetic complexity of genetics and why admixture and history really matters. So when I was growing up in, in Africa, we have sub-Saharan Africa where everybody is black and we're black and proud. When it comes to the America, everyone says, well, black is a social construct because somebody called us black. Well, I don't know what that is, but the color of my skin, <laughs> at least if you look at the color spectrum, is black, right? So what is the biology in the melanin and how do people get different gradations of having different uh, 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 amount of darkness. And, you know, I look in my clinic, people who come to my clinic have different shades of black, right? People in southern uh, uh, Italy may be darker than people in northern Italy because it really depends on how the sun is interacting with your genetics. When we cloned the P16 uh, and, you know, all the other uh, melanoma susceptibility genes, it turns out that even those who have inherited dysplastic nevus syndrome, if they don't ever get sun exposure, they're not going to get skin cancer, right? So therein lies the whole question about gene environment interaction, whether people are mistreated, what the social construct is. So that's how I understand getting to the root of breast cancer heterogeneity. So having done that, my husband is also trying to get to the root of asthma heterogeneity because they told us that black children were dying of asthma at alarming rates in Chicago. And we asked, is it, you know, it's been in the literature, oh, it's because, you know, of hygiene, they had, you know, hygiene hypothesis. What is hygiene hypothesis? Some people are dirty and some people are not. Then all of a sudden now we have microbiome and people say, oh, microbiome is good for you. And we're now eating our own poop because we want microbiome. That's what micro, that's, that, those are, fecal transplant is now being done in bone marrow transplant. And yet we spend the time telling about people who are dirty and people who are not. So think about history and what we have done. But anyway, the good news is that we got to Nigeria 
and we realize that they're not dying because of their genes. We're di they're dying because of environmental pollution. They're dying because of uh, uh, burning, you know, uh, household air pollution. Four million children die because they, are, they have energy, uh, uh, energy poverty. They're, they're, they're burning dung. They're in cold areas. So is it their gene or is it just that we haven't protected the environment, right? So those of us who are doctors asking to go and think, so he's, he's, he's on top of the world in Chicago. This is, uh, you know, going to have fun in, at Napa Valley and seeing this is great country, right? And then you, we get to India, we get to Delhi, and children can't go out to play because of pollution. And now we see what's happening with all the air fires. I woke up one day in Chicago, I couldn't get out because of the fires. So we're in this together, it's not us versus them, because when that wind is blowing, we don't know what wind blew to cause a DNA damage that's gonna lead to cancer. But we all spend our time doing druggable targets. And I remember when uh, I got a call from the uh, uh, ASP, uh, Ka uh, Kappa Consortium, and you know, they sequenced the genome at Johns Hopkins at CIDR. And it says, oh, you know, we got the samples from you, for you from your Nigerian cohort. Is there something missing? We, saw, we see malaria, we see all these things, but there's about 10% you know, of the genome that's not in the reference genome. Where did it come from? Have you guys heard that story that 10% of our reference genome, 296 million bases, we're missing because we had just sequenced a white man, right? And now we're all sequencing more genomes. We're trying to inter interpret more genomes. What are we missing? So the question is, what are we missing? What assumptions are we saying? So when people are talking about algorithm and using artificial intelligence and training, the biases in the question is why people are pushing back and saying, you cannot replicate your data because you, didn't, you, you don't even know the tip of the iceberg is all you're looking at. And so we've all done candidate gene approaches. We're looking for BRCA3, we couldn't find it. Every time we want to do a study, we can't replicate it. That's not rigorous science, right? As long as we're honest about it. So that's why I started collaborating with uh, Chuck Peru, who is at the North Carolina Breast Cancer Study. And you can see in my part, in my, the pattern of admixture, that there's some slaves in North Carolina that they're still in the indigenous state. There's no admixture, there's no uh, water piping in their communities, and they're still living as if they were in Africa. So we wanted to begin to look at what's happening in North Carolina, and that's a North Carolina breast cancer study has become a really important information for us. And then Dijon Ho, who's my cancer epidemiology, has been going to Nigeria to try and integrate some of the risk factors because we can't study the populations of the world because there's 7.5 billion people. So how are we going to study 7.5 billion genomes? One step at a time. We can only do what we can do. So that's why we've been really looking at the landscape and then we're looking at cancer evolutionary trajectory signatures and, um, and then uh, using that to inform uh, what we do, uh, interacting uh, genomic, uh, looking at uh, uh, germline and somatic. And I couldn't do this in my lab anymore because I don't have the money to do it and I don't have the high throughput. So we, we collaborate with New York Genome Center and uh, temples and cancer IQ and of all of this for different reasons because we really wanted to make sure that we can democratize access. And that's what I was talking to the executive director of cancer genome. You know, we had a promise to the patients that they will have access. And if they don't have access, we're not fulfilling the promise of genomics. So that's my challenge to all of you who run labs now is to think about who is missing and how can we actually accelerate the future? Because you know, sub-Saharan black women versus white women, when we started looking, doing comparative studies across the, the, the continent, you know, you know a lot about all of us having really diverged as we moved out of Africa. 
Statistical geneticists will tell you, oh, well, we, we diverge about, you know, a thousand, you know, how many thousand years ago. That's all assumptions based on mathematical modeling. That's, so if somebody comes to me and says, no, God created the world. Okay, whatever you believe, that's okay. But at least we're discovering it one by one, right? But I'm not going to say they're stupid for saying that that's what they believe in. Because it turns out that in my language, my father being a pastor, the oral language from my Yorubas is that actually we, there's a place in the Yoruba kingdom where God came from heaven and there's a, there's a clear designation of where that place is in Nigeria. So when I'm talking to people, I was like, I don't know, that's what they told me. I don't know whether it's the truth or not, but as we've done mitochondria DNA and we've tracked everybody, at least we know everybody started somewhere in Africa. Are we in agreement with that? Maybe there will be something else we're going to discover in another galaxy, right? People are now going to space, and maybe there are aliens that are going to take over our planet. We don't know, but we are discovering it, right? So I don't know what the world is going to look like 20 years from now. I just know that right now, we know there's genetic admixture. We know that mutation signatures may reflect etiologic risk factors. And for those of you who are running labs, you know you see all those signatures, right? And we know it was nice that we're looking at, you know, uh, HPV signature, um, you know, viral, I mean, hepatitis signature, because we have the phenotypes now, right? The doctors now accept that they need to send samples to you in the molecular pathology lab, and you guys are now using the signatures to make calls, and that's wonderful. But the question is, it's wonderful. What are you going to do about it? So this is an example of a really nice paper. And of course, if you're studying uh, under uh, studied uh, populations, it's going to be very hard for you to get your paper published in Nature first, right? Because Nature is going to publish on white populations and I kid my friends, and the papers are either coming from Wash U in St. Louis or they're coming from Cambridge, right? And the rest of us then scramble to get there. Or now that, you know, a Memorial Sloan Kettering has done their impact study, we're all going to be scrambling because those were convenient samples. Those were elite institutions. Elite institutions were published first. That's the bottom line. So when we started now looking at who is doing what, and this is complex, but you just need to know that now, I, thanks to the bioinformaticians, we have pattern recognition, and we can do the patterns. And so what we found was that, yeah, the Nigerian samples, you can dichotomize them, right? The ones that are, do, are due to uh, pic 3 ca and CDH1 mutations, and the ones that are due to homologous re uh, recombination deficiency. Right? And so, and then you have the in, in between. And so that was using exome sequencing. And of course, we knew if we did exome, maybe that's just a fraction, right? Because we're missing the genome, right? So then we went on and replicated, uh, not even replicated. We were like, we have very little money, but the money we have, we've got to do whole genome sequencing of tumor normal pairs from Nigerian women to get a deeper knowledge of genomic aberrations. And guess what? Lots of single-base substitutions to really uh, further refine our HRD signature, double-base substitutions, higher activity in the Nigerian tumors, and then Indel, we discovered a novel Indel uh, 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 signature that showed a clear positive climb from white to black uh, to Nigerian groups, uh, both in prevalence and activity. Now, this is now, the, the way we did the experiment was to say, okay, we're going to go to Nigeria first, right? Because that's the earliest genome, and that's a hundred genomes from Africa, from Nigeria. And then we're going to see what is in TCGA, that is 40 African Americans, right? And then what is in uh, uh, European and Americans? For the first time, the Nigerians overwhelmed the European uh, genome sequencing. And then we could see the pattern clearly. 
So this is why, depending on how you do your experiment, you may get a result that you can interpret. So even I, that I'm not a bioinformatician, I can see that, wow, look at all this, which is very few in the uh, TCGA database. So I hope that you know, the computational algorithms are gonna continue to help us further classify. And for those of you who um, you know, do this work, you understand that germline BRCA1 uh, and BRCA2, we already defined that BRCA1 is a germline mutation and they get HRD if they have chromosomal instability. So then we did the reverse. We wanted to identify all the BRCA1 and BRCA2 based on using this called HRD score to identify everything. And we won't be able to classify it unless we use the combination of Indel and SV signatures. And when we did that, then the classification got better. Okay, and you're not gonna be able to get to indels if you're not doing whole genome sequencing. You may get a little bit of the exon, uh, uh, exon intron boundaries. So that's why I said the more we look, the more we find. But this experiment to do whole genome at 7,500 per person is just the tip of the iceberg. If we get a $1,000 genome, or maybe we get a genome for 500, maybe we will be able to do more high throughput. But we are making progress, and we just have to be honest about the kind of progress that we were going to be able to make. And then, this is also complicated if you are not uh, uh, in there. So what is the difference between the Nigerian and the, um, and the uh, TCGA data set? It turns out that the average age of a Nigerian patient is 47. Okay, so whenever they ask us, okay, what is the difference? Why are you getting a different result? I would say the average person who gets breast cancer in America is in their sixth decade of life. That's why we tell everybody, when you are 50, go and get your mammogram. Or we debate, should it be 40 or should it be 50? Because we treat everybody the same. And yet, we can look at, at the time when whole genome duplication starts. If you start with a P53 as your driver mutation or GATA3 as a driver mutation, you go through different trajectory, right? Some will have accelerated and by 25, they already have breast cancer. They were born and they may not have a BRCA1 mutation. At what point do they develop that extra uh, uh, change? So that's really, uh, trying to understand what goes on. So Mary Claire King and I went back and we did a very expensive experiment, which was take a thousand cases and a thousand controls from Nigeria and look for pathogenic mutations. And say, what proportion of these patients have pathogenic mutations? Guess what? If we use the Broca panel, and for those of you who do germline, Broca is a French scientist who, like my African-American families, published the pedigree of his family, and we found that clearly 15% of the patients who were walking through the door had a germline mutation. Okay, so that would explain why 34% of the somatic uh, uh, patients that we were looking for in these patients had HRD score, and maybe more that we haven't actually explored. And then we went back and looked at BRC1, BRC2, PALB2, P53, and then other genes. And you can see, we replicated it in Cameroon and Uganda. We went to Brazil, replicated it. And then this is the African-American cohort. I hope you can see it in your, uh, on your day. They are older. They are at least a decade older. They too, this is 5,000 cases and controls. The carrier study looked at more than you know, 33,000 to see the same signal that we saw with just a thousand cases and a thousand songs. And they will publish that the frequency is lower because they're not looking at early onset breast cancer. And for geneticists, you know, if you're looking for a complex trait that has early onset, you look at the, a younger cohort. So when I explained this data, I was like, these are the data 
of people who walk through the door in these countries and get breast cancer. So when we then advocate that we should have population-based testing, everyone said, no, 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 we can't do that. But if you don't do that, these people are going to show up with advanced breast cancer at age 35 because these are highly penetrant genes, right? Look at the paper that was published in the New England Journal by the Breast Cancer Association Consortium. The top genes, sorry, this is moved down as we uh, transferred my files, but the top genes are BRC1, BRC2, and um, PALB2, and then everything else drops off. Right? So in, the, in your pathology lab, I, I see people who are looking at CHECK2, who are doing all of that. We've studied them in 100,000 breast cancer cases. So if you see them in your leukemia panel, come talk to us. Okay? So now we know the penetrance, not just based on family ascertainment, but now based on population-based cases and controls. And because we're not talking to one another, then we worry about the penetrance. So these three genes, BRC1, BRC2, BRC, uh, and PALB2, they're the top genes for breast cancer in every population. It's not just black or white. They're the top. So it just depends on the frequency. If you have a founder mutation, you may have more. If you don't have a founder mutation, you may have less. But we've sequenced people all over the world. And then you see this drop off, and then you see the average population risk, right? So we talk about high risk, intermediate, and then average population. So how many of you know your BRCA status? Raise your hand. Okay. I do because I joined the wisdom study. You can, get, you can join a study to just know who needs to do population stratification. So the day I, we started doing this work, Beyonce's dad suddenly showed up on television and says, how many of you know Beyonce? <laughs> well, if, if you had, you know, my son was a teenager and when he told me to download Beyonce on my Instagram because I was too boring. There was nothing, I was following science and all of that. And she said, put Beyonce on. And then I, of course, knew about his dad, I mean, her dad. But he went on television to say, I have BRCA2 mutation. And I have chest wall breast, uh, cancer because he doesn't want to call it breast cancer. And he was the first celebrity to talk about BRCA2. And now we know BRCA2 is the most important gene for prostate cancer. And all of you, if you run a... Uh, molecular diagnostic lab, your urologists are going to ask you, they want to know that BRCA2 status because they want to use PAP inhibitor. They're going to do pancreatic cancer, all pancreatic cancer, because they want to use PAP inhibitors. They're going to ask you because immunotherapy works when you combine with this because you're doing tumor mutational burden and you're getting all the Lynch syndromes. Lynch described Lynch syndrome as a medical oncologist because he just wanted to see all the people in his family. But it wasn't until we can test everybody that we are now finding so many people. And he said, I have a strong family history. I, they look at all this, but nobody ever told me. But because he was involved and he was knowledgeable, he said, you need to go out and tell everybody, male and female, you get your genes, autosomal dominant, right? But the women had led this force. That's why we know a lot more about women. But men's health, all the men here, go home and get yourself tested. Because what we know is that if you do genotype uh, uh, screening for prevention, you're actually going to pick up all the, this is a six millimeter BRCA1 associated breast cancer. This woman has dense breasts. She wouldn't have, it wouldn't come out in anything. If you don't get yourself tested, you're not gonna know, right? So the European uh, Union and uh, the, in Europe where they have healthcare, where there's no uh, uh, discrimination, where there's oncogenetics clinic, they've solved this and they've adopted MRI screening every six months for BRCA1 mutation carriers based on the evidence that you will pick it up at six millimeter. So why are we 
saying one size fits all. So I see a lot of people are in AI and they're trying to develop algorithm. Our guys are developing it for prostate cancer. They're developing it for breast cancer. And we just got funded to do Chicago Alternate Prevention Study. Because as I said, when I tell my patients on the south side of Chicago who are healthy to go and remove body parts, they're like, oh, we ain't to that yet. Where they don't know about plastic surgery, they don't want to do it, they just want a way to manage their risk. So that's why they forced us to actually uh, develop our cancer risk clinic, to develop MRI screening, and to predict, preempt, and prevent cancer. And so if we can really focus on prevention and predictive, we can go beyond you know, being a soothsayer. Because when I was telling them in 1992, it was like, what? And it even turned out that some people in, the, in their family got breast cancer, even though they didn't have the mutation. And we said, oh, that's you know, sporadic cancer within the context of you also have a family history. Try to explain that to somebody who is not a geneticist, and they were like, ah, that's voodoo medicine. We don't believe it, right? So I tell people the two things I do that people don't believe, vaccines and genetics. <laughs> and you can divide the world into red state, blue state, but they're both legitimate, right? Depending on what you are, how you are communicating risk, right? So we have to do better because now is the time to adopt genome-informed healthcare. I saw this in 1996, and I wrote an editorial. Look at the BRCA1 mutation carriers. They're actually doing better when you gave them platinum. There was only 43 patients. That's my risk-adapted treatment. We know we can cure these patients. And I have patients in my clinic who got platinum done, but now they have access to five different PAP inhibitors orally that they can even take even much earlier. So that's how we celebrate the success of genomics. Now we need to get it for population risk stratification so we can get people screened. And we need to streamline point of care counseling. There are not enough genetic counselors. We agree there are not enough genetic counselors. But the question is, are we going to stay stuck because there are not enough genetic counselors? And this is why I know some of you are partnering with personalized cancer prevention. We can screen for breast cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer. You can, in the lab, alert people from doing the somatic that, guess what? If you know how many people get referred to me now because they got a somatic test. There was no pre-test counseling. There was, everybody just took this child with leukemia, sequenced their, their tumor. Guess what? They have PALB2 mutation. What should they do about the mother? right, the parents. So nobody is doing pre-test counseling because your germline determines your somatic. And now we're all in it together. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I'm just using this as a, a, a slice that I borrowed from Dr. Westgate, who really is thinking about healthcare uh, to create a population health strategy where Prepare primary care physicians. We, they can't all come to my clinic. And you guys have to go back home and say, all of these things that you are sending to our lab, they include the germline. So how are you going to take care of the patients? Because we are now you know, going to EPIC to find all the germline. Because they just report, and that's it. It's buried in there. So who has responsibility for informing the patient that this is a PALB2 in a two-year-old leukemia patient? What are the parents going to do about it? So, so that's why we're talking about people with cancer history, people with uh, family history, get them tested, think about how you are going to find high risk, moderate risk, low risk. And so this is really from um, you know, a, a primary care. The OB geneticists have been doing OB. They're doing prenatal counseling. So we've sort of test, told them, just go ahead and figure out how you can uh, include this in your uh, in your EHR. So by putting things in EHR, hopefully you can generate better tools to manage the patient and measure your outcomes. So I'm going to end by saying that um, I think we need public-private partnership to move ahead. Uh, we can't just be using clinical features because the clinical features will be too subjective, black, white. What does that mean? So that's why President Obama, is he black or white? His mother is white, his father is 
you know, you get, uh, from Kenya. So how are you going to categorize him? So that's why the whole idea about precision medicine is look at me for who I am. My genome matters. But then if my genome is based on segregation, then you're just stratifying me. If you're going to uh, 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 precision, then we have to have health care for all. So I'm hoping that the precision medicine in initiative now is all of us, right? We're all in this together. And so my take home message is there's really a lot that we can do together. And we have to really have a vision for how genomics can truly transform healthcare and broaden global access to innovative genome informed patient centered research in all communities. When we do the research, the research will inform our practice. Until we do it, we don't know because we have not done the research. So I got that revelation climbing Kilimanjaro with my children on the African continent. Who would have thought that I could get to the summit? Of course, with help from my children, we're like, we're going to go slowly. And by going slowly, we actually got to the summit. But it didn't happen overnight. So thank you all and uh, my team that's really made this possible. Thank you very much, Dr. Alapati, for this very inspiring talk. We definitely got so many, uh, so, so many ideas to think about, so much food for thought. Uh, so we will now take questions for Dr. Alapati from the audience. Everybody's stunned. What did she just <laughs> talk about? <laughs> Hi. Um, I actually knew Dr. Rowley. I got my PhD with her husband. Ah. Donald. So, so we, we overlapped at University of Chicago. Um, one of the questions that I had in one of your earlier slides, I was very surprised to see the difference in the rates of BRCA1 positive breast cancer in African American women compared to West African women. Do you, ha is that because of a genetic bottleneck or do you, do you have any ideas about that? Why there's that difference? Yeah, so that's a great question. So that's why I took the time to talk about genetic admixture, right? There's some self-report, we have a debate now. Do you take black self-report or do you take uh, genetic ancestry to represent African-American? So depending on who you uh, are studying, the average age for the African-American, and now for breast cancer, we actually have gone on with screening. Blacks in America actually do more screening because of the outreach, and they do, they get, the incidence of breast cancer is exactly the same as with uh, 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 white patients. The problem is the mortality, okay? So if the incidence is, so as you get older, you can get ER positive breast cancer. We're all getting older, right? Who has had a chance to get older? So the African American cohort, their average age was 55. The average age of the Nigerian, Uganda, and Cameroon, the average age was 47. Now, the average age of the Breast Cancer Association Consortium was 62. I don't know if you notice the difference in the gradation. In the US, we do mammogram. Everybody's been going to get their mammogram, right? And then you find those incidental cancers. And we're talking about overdiagnosis. You go in, you have DCIS, you have cancer, right? ER positive. Many more people are surviving. And now we're debating even prostate cancer. We say, should you even get a PSA? Because PSA leads to overdiagnosis. But if you have a BRCA2 mutation, your prostate cancer is going to be at 45, at 50, right? So that's why when you are doing population screening, you want to enrich. So our study in Nigeria was not designed to find young people. It's just that young people are the ones who are getting this cancer, right? And they average it. So every time we have to publish our paper, we have to say, remember the population structure. In Chicago, we have more Polish women 
in Chicago than maybe the only other place is Warsaw. So we see all the Polish founder mutations, and we say they're Eastern European. If anybody calls you Eastern European, won't you say which part of Eastern Europe, right? So even the Ashkenazi Jewish mutation that we're talking about, it just arose in Eastern Europe. But because we can find them quickly, they're the ones that we've been studying the most. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I come from uh, Mount Sinai in New York City, and we have a vast, diverse population who we do genomics on. So I'm going to ask you if you could look into your glass ball, please, and tell us whether or not you think where it'll ever happen that when a patient walks into the door, we can actually get a flavor of their genetic heterogeneity given this admixture of populations now do you think that there will be too many legal concerns regarding that and assessment so that we can use that to inform our interpretations oh, of a patient's results? Fantastic. Now you've come to my side of the, <laughs> of the equation. So when we started, we put a lot of legal framework in because we were paternalistic, because we were worried about being sued. Okay, and now that the test is available, guess what my legal department is telling me? Well, if you don't put it in the EHR, you're gonna get screwed anyway, <laughs> right? Because you can't see a BRCA1 mutation in your test and not be obligated to find the at-risk person. So, however, privacy trumps duty to warn. Right? So that's why I'm warning my primary care doctors and I'm warning the oncologists and I'm telling all the people in our, in our system, everybody gets cancer for one reason or the other. At this point, if they walk in your door with cancer and you're gonna do the somatic testing, you better at least inform them of the possibility that they're gonna have germline mutation. So my colleagues, the WHO has even made our life even worse because now the WHO has classified leukemia and lymphoma based on germline genetics. So that's suckling back. I went to Solid Tumor to help them understand genetics, and now you guys have put us in trouble because you are not going to diagnose any leukemia without some DDX1 showing up. So in our, at our case conference, where I keep telling them, I said, Okay, you're finding all this check two. You better come talk to me because we've discussed the penetrance of check two and we have the data. Don't start a whole new way of looking at check two because these founder mutations are going to be everywhere in your hereditary panel. And they are. If you look at the top genes in, and uh, Jane Chopek and Michael Drazer, if you do mesothelioma, the top genes, yeah, you may have back one, but you're gonna find BRCA1 and BRCA2, every head and neck cancer, lung cancer. And then I ask them, are they founder mutations? And people don't even, what do you mean founder mutations? I was like, yeah, are they from Iceland? Are they from Poland? Where are they from? All of those are in the breast cancer database because the breast cancer advocates pushed to get the research done. And now everybody is coming behind them. So yes, the answer in Mount Sinai is, trust me, I gave a lecture there and I've told them, you have such a diverse population, just do it and engage the community and you will be able to interpret the data. But if you have VUS, that's where you get stuck because you have to go back and reclassify the VUS. And I think knowing the admixture of the individual just at the genetic level is going to help and breed a whole new AI field of integrating the admixture genetically with those risk variants. Absolutely, so, absolutely. That's why these are exciting times for human geneticists. We're back in business. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that inspiring talk. Um, I'm Beth Patel, I'm a clinical variant scientist at Mayo Clinic. Um, my question is about, um, do you have any advice for those of us who are in kind of the knowledge-based community who are trying to, you know, democratize access to, you know, critically um, kind of process summaries of data to help drive kind of this, uh, like a more equitable 
um, source of data that we're presenting to you know the world and our communities. Yeah, well, so this is why you know I I was just telling um, uh, everyone that I left Michigan enjoying the good weather finally in Chicago because there only one there's only one season in Chicago and that's summer. But I came because you are the audience that I'm looking for, right? And we all need to do this in solidarity. And when I walked in the door, I saw my black brother there. And I was like, yes, there's a guy there. <laughs> we need to be inclusive with everything that we do. And if you don't have data, you have to say, this doesn't make any sense. Because we know, as cancer genomicists, we need everybody sequenced. So if you're going to start a lab, I just negotiated to have your executive director train people who are doing our work in Nigeria. Because we're not going to make sense of the science, and I think the commercial labs are ahead of us. They will innovate. I remember taking all the samples from my, from my lab, feeling dejected that, you know, Myriad scooped me. But guess what? Now any lab can do BRCA testing. Even the Supreme Court helped us. That's the only time I agreed with the Supreme Court. <laughs> right? But they say there's no affirmative action. I'm all for it. Just let's all come together in solidarity. That's all I care for, right? Because we know we can't do the science unless we do it in solidarity. By the way, we have a clinical cancer genetics conference in Chicago. It's going to be April 19th to 21st. Come, because you're going to be meeting with genetic counselors. You're going to be meeting with all the clinicians who want to do this right. And they're ready for it. Thank you. We are running out of time, but we will allow one quick question. Okay. <laughs> I hope you have break after this. <laughs> this is an amazing, inspiring talk. Uh, my question is that um, have you done or do you know of any studies in the Middle East? Oh. Because it seems like one of the least studied areas. Actually, the, the reason why I, you know, I, I don't know how you, many of you know Mary Claire King, but she's really about genetic justice, right? She worked in Argentina, she's going around, and the minute I started working in Nigeria, she did all that sequencing in her lab. In my lab, I have a woman from Tunisia. Uh, 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 you know, there's a lot of things that people are doing through Europe because of the French connection. In another month, I'm going to Brazil, because everybody, when they hear this, they are, it's a compelling argument, and I think we presented to the WHO uh, Science Summit that the WHO, especially after the pandemic, we all now realize that every community needs a PCR machine, right? How can you turn that PCR machine into whatever sequencing you want, nanopore, Illumina, whatever, right? This is not rocket science anymore, right? So plenty of data will come out of the Middle East because the, uh, not only uh, uh, do we know about Israel, we're actually going to a meeting in Israel. The Palestinians, Palestinians are there. They found our mutations. Do you know that if, for those of you who study the Bible, when we do you know, genetics across the Jewish diaspora, Mesopotamia, does anybody know what, who Mesopotamia is? The modern day Iraq. Right? Christians believe that you know, Jesus was going back and forth. We think that that's where the admixture happened when Jews were returning from Babylon and all of those things that people wrote about in the Bible. So there's historic document that actually science supports. And I think we're encouraging everybody, Asian uh, data all over the world, to say we need to de demystify genetics and use genetics to accelerate progress. So this is my last comment. So I went to a meeting of the South Korean Gen uh, Medical Genetics Consortium. And when I told them that BRCA1, if you have it, then we're going to recommend having your ovaries removed. And one of the medical geneticists, a man, came up and said, oh, then they're going to become men. I was like, no, they're not. <laughs> But that's the level of sophistication that even medical geneticists and doctors have about preventive services. Of course, they're not going to become men, 
We can fix that, but we don't have a way to screen for ovarian cancer. So if they're done having their children, why shouldn't we take that out, right? That's a level of education that we have to give to people in the community. And if we don't do it, then, you know, uh, direct-to-consumer marketing will do it, and then it will ruin everything for us because they will have variant calling may be wrong. And trust me, we have a lot of people who come to us where the calls were wrong and they gave the wrong results. So let's think about how we can do this safely, how we can write the algorithm better, share knowledge, and create knowledge in a diverse way so that nobody gets hurt. When we were doing candidate gene approach, every SNP, every, every SNP that was associated with bad outcomes was associated with being black. And that's why the community pushed back that it's not about being black, it's about what does this gene do? So I'm glad that we're doing gene level, region level, and all the other things that we need to integrate into our molecular diagnostics. Thank you.